Chapter 19. Governor Avon Claris. The governor's personal library was his most treasured possession. While the rest of the mansion sparkled with polished marble and gilded trim, this room was full of warmth, and the dark mahogany wood was saturated with the sweet smell of beeswax candles, paper, and aged leather. The cozy, circular room was packed from floor to ceiling with books at the center of the room was his large desk that was full of maps and a lot of other various oddities, a large hourglass and star charts. In the corner, there was a large telescope. Tonight, Claris was not at his work desk. He was in his regal navy blue silk robe. He was sitting in his large cushioned green leather chair. And he had his sandaled feet propped up onto a matching stool, warming his toes by the fireplace. Just as he reached over to find his reading spectacles, the door flew open. Uh, I'm terribly sorry to disturb you, sir, but there is someone to see you, the butler announced. Clarice grimaced as he rubbed the deep weathered lines in his forehead and reluctantly set his reading glasses back down on the little table beside him. He didn't bother to turn around or to get angry by the tone of his butler's voice. It was obviously someone he couldn't throw out. If that had been the case, he was quite certain James would have done so already and filled him in all the lovely details at breakfast. Who is it, James? he asked hardly. Magi Frey, sir. She insists it's very important. Claris perked up. Well, this was going to be interesting. Ah, smashing! Please send her in. James let out. An audible gulp, and he nervously cleared his throat. Uh, sir, uh, she, um, she is here already. Pardon? Glarus asked as he glanced up toward James. James gestured toward the tall mage standing in the middle of the room. Clarus strained his neck as he twisted around in his chair and let out a surprised guffaw. Well, this is quite unusual and very exciting. You are very ambitious, I see, he chuckled. Welcome. Come, have a seat by the fire, he beckoned. Do you want any refreshments? I suppose you are here to uh, talk about your estate and the dragon, he surmised, and pointed to the stone chessboard on the table between them. <laughs> do, do you play, he ventured. Nora made her way over toward the second chair by the fireplace. She glanced disdainfully toward the chessboard. She hated chess. There were too many rules. Besides, she was not here to play games. At least not board games. And so she remained standing and fixed her best and meanest glare down onto the governor. How long... Have you had this frost dragon, she demanded. Claire smiled, a smug smile, as he scooped up a cracker and slice of cheese from the silver snack tray beside him and took his time chewing before he answered. Mm. Excellent, so you have met the dragon called Helvisti. I trust things are going well, he remarked as he reached over to the snack tray. Nora's thin nostrils flared. His name is Winter, and you didn't answer my question. How long have you had this frost dragon, she demanded. Claris turned his head to the side as he thoughtfully stroked his large, bristly, white mustache, causing little crumbs to fall down his robe. Oh, I would say well over twenty years. We brought her in as a little fledgling. 
She was becoming quite the nuisance, but the tribespeople revere her as a physical incarnation of Helvesi. So you can say, we've sort of had her around for a while, but as you can imagine, as the dragon has grown, she has become very hard to manage. Nora was dumbfounded. Let me get this straight. You've had a frost dragon for twenty years, and you haven't even bothered to tell anyone, she demanded. Claris smiled and put his hand up so he could finish chewing. Mm. Oh, alas, I'm sorry to say that Helvisti is a perfectly normal, yet still very beautiful, albino Hendrake. He informed her, and then quickly brushed the crumbs from his hands before making another broad sweeping gesture. I have a whole shelf of books devoted to dragons, and I at one time had hoped and thought the same as you, but alas, I fear frost dragons are somewhat of, of a myth, and if they did exist like the legends, well, they do not exist anymore. Nora pressed her fingertips together and took in a deep, serene, calming breath. Oh, I see. Well, I am terribly sorry for bothering you. I had no idea. May I borrow a few of your books? Claris gave a sympathetic nod. Perfectly all right. I am happy you stopped by. And, and don't feel bad. When I was a young whippersnapper, I climbed all those snowy mountains and searched the caves, hoping to find one. I even picked up a piece of obsidian from the foot of Helvisti's blessed mountain, he encouraged, and turned toward his butler. Um, James, please find the memoirs of a mender for Rinke and the search for the mythical frost dragons of the north, he instructed. James bowed and quickly pulled out a large blue book with worn gold trim edges and presented it to Nora. Nora gratefully accepted the beautiful book with an appreciative smile. Clarice nodded in approval. I think you will like it very much. Please come visit again. I will let you borrow another. But when he looked down at his plate of cheese and crackers, James let out a shrill strangled wail of protest. Ah, that book is priceless, the butler shrieked. Claris turned. His eyes went wide in horror as James had bodily placed himself in front of the hungry, crackling yellow flames of the fireplace and the mage. The cheese and crackers went flying as he frankly shot to his feet. Oh, what are you doing? he gasped. Nora could have easily used magic to burn the book or push the butler out of the way. But, after a brief struggle, she allowed the frantic butler to wrestle the book away. Inwardly, she was rather quite glad. She didn't really want to burn the book. She was just out to make a point and to get the governor's attention. And it had worked quite well. Clarice was beat red and quivering with rage. How dare you, he began. How dare you, Nora snapped back and poked him hard in the chest until he flopped back down into his chair. How dare you, he roared from his chair. Nora thundered back, her face going red and veins flaring from her neck as she raged. How dare you keep my poor dragon in such wretched conditions? Do you have any idea how much that poor creature has suffered? You will never be elected again after the people of Helvisti have seen what you have done to my dragon. The blustering von Claris wilted in his chair. That that can't be possible. I put General Gordon in charge of its care. He assured me that he had everything under control and that he was going to bring in an expert, he countered. 
I am the expert, and I am appalled at the conditions General Gordon and his cronies have kept that poor creature in. Winter has been absolutely miserable and wretched, Nora shouted down at him. Governor Von Claris slammed his palms down onto the sides of his chair. Dear gods, you're, you're absolutely right. Why, in sweet Helvisti's name, didn't you come to me sooner, he demanded. Nora nodded, but before she could respond, he thrust his thick stubby finger into the air and shot to his feet. This is outrageous. James, bring me my winter coat and shoes, he commanded, and he turned to Nora. I am so glad you have come to me. General Gordon will be held fully responsible for this gross negligence, he vowed. I would be eternally grateful if you could spare some of your staff. The whole estate is an utter ruin and disrepair. I have been left without security. I don't want people snooping around or interfering with Winter's training, especially after the horrible abuse she has suffered. I'm afraid of what may happen if any children were to sneak in. Dear gods, of course, absolutely, Von Claris assured her. Nora blinked rapidly, forcing several tears out. May have this to bless you, she sniffled. The governor quickly rushed to her side and gently patted her hand in his. My dear, you must be so overwhelmed. He comforted her and quickly passed over a clean black silk handkerchief from his top pocket. I just hate to see such a... Poor, beautiful dragon suffer so, Dora gasped breathlessly. She was really working it up now. It's been living in its own filth for weeks, and I have no place to put her. The whole place is in ruin, and the barn is a horrid rat's nest and about to collapse. And General Gordon... Send all my engineers to help back Glendon. I haven't anyone to help me. Oh, that's absolutely dreadful. There, there, my dear. I, I had no idea. Please don't cry, Clarice gasped. Nora allowed herself to be guided over to the large comfy chair. I'm so sorry I shouted at you. I was so upset. My... Hut burned down, and my poor dragon is in terrible condition, she sniffled. It burned down? How did that happen, he gasped. Nora hesitated. Cooking fire? I've been living on gruel since I've been here, and General Gordon said if I complained, he would have me flogged, and you are the only one left I have to turn to, she blubbered. So, you have been staying in a little hut all this time in the middle of winter, Clarice gasped. Nor nodded. Not for long. You will stay in the guest house adjacent to mine until this injustice is made right, he vowed. As he slipped into his heavy bearskin fur coat, rest, my dear. James will take care of you. While well, I go pay General Samoth Gordon a visit, he declared. I'll go with you, Nora volunteered. Nonsense! Your job is to take care of the spirit of Helvisti. My job is to deal with everybody else. James glanced wordily back over toward the beautiful books and turned toward Nora. Shall I... Show you to the guest house, Magi, he offered in a overly hopeful voice. You are so very sweet, James. Yes, thank you, she agreed. James smiled and quickly hurried over to her, making certain to place himself between the wall of books and the psychotic firebug to his right. I shall get some of the female staff to see that you are settled in and comfortable, he assured her. That is very chivalrous of you. If I didn't have Vila, you would make a wonderful sword companion, she praised him. James perked up and stood a little taller. Oh no, Magi, I wouldn't know what to do with a sword, he laughed. You seem quite fit. 
Do you have any other skills? Can you draw maps? she asked. James shook his head. Well, I did a lot of swimming before this job. I used to go diving for oysters, he said proudly. You certainly seem to know your way around this library. I imagine you're quite educated, she remarked. I really wish they would change the name Sword Companion. It is so misleading, as they hardly ever need to use a sword unless their mage is trying to keep a low profile or injured, she sighed. James grimaced. Not really. I know how to read, write, and do mass, but I'm not formally educated. I just read a lot, that's all. That is one of the things I like about my job, he chuckled. Don't sell yourself short. Not everyone can do those things. Have you ever been to Glendon before, she asked. James smiled. I have seen pictures and read about it. It sounds wonderful. Nora smiled. You should see the size of the library at Founders. James bit his lower lip, and a hard line formed on his forehead. I heard that's only for mages. I wouldn't be allowed in, he lamented. The librarians have sword companions as well, Nora pointed out. James blinked. Well, I suppose they had to keep the book safe, he remarked. Nora felt a stab of guilt for the little stunt she had pulled, which involved threatening to burn the library book. Well, they do more than sort books. You see, librarians also organize search parties and look for things. Lost things, old things, relics, ancient cities, fossils, and different medicinal plants they find in old texts. And sometimes they journey thousands of miles and take their sword companions with them. It could be quite interesting. James was silent for several long moments. Their footsteps echoed loudly as they continued to walk through the marble halls. Do you think... I could really be a sword companion, he asked. Nora laughed. That isn't up to me, but I think you would be pleasantly surprised and very happy with the generous salary you would receive from founders if you completed your training and were selected, she assured him.